What's up everyone, it's Endymion, and yeah, here I am again, three days in a row because the news won't stop coming, and of course there's some new shenanigans happening all over. From Tifa Lockhart being censored in Final Fantasy VII Remake, Nexus mods yet again banning people over trying to course correct, and the massive PlayStation layoffs. There's a lot to go over today. But first, let's start with Final Fantasy VII and the whole Tifa controversy. So recently, there was an 8GB update that randomly appeared mere days before Rebirth launched for the previous game, Final Fantasy VII Remake. The patch said that allegedly it would be for bugs and fixes, but if you know anything about this stuff, 8GB for some bug fixes is ridiculously high, and of course within that patch was some nefarious changes. As of right now, we don't know all of the changes, but we do know that for sure Tifa's chest was covered up more in the flashback sequence in Nibelheim within Remake. Here's a side-by-side -side comparison so that you can see the changes. Obviously, the change here is that Tifa now has a black undershirt covering her chest. However, as many fans were quick to point out, Tifa within this scene is 15 years old, so, you know, underage. Of course, within the confines of Japanese society, which obviously Remake was made in, 16 is their age of consent. But of course, outside of Japan, this is considered a child. While I'm not per se angry about the cover-up since she is 15 here, but this does irk me the wrong way for other reasons. Which is of course not only censorship, but how companies are able to effectively change things months or years later in this case, long after they already have your money. It's a similar tactic used by many games that have live service elements. For example, a few years back, if a game released with an item shop from the get-go, the existence of microtransactions and other in-game purchases would directly affect the game's Metacritic score. This would result in reviewers becoming disillusioned and would rate games lower than expected due to the extra greediness on display from these games at release. Of course, game studios and publishers didn't like this idea, but they also didn't want to sacrifice the entire concept of microtransactions in their games either. This then resulted in many games like Tekken 8, for example, releasing day one without a cash shop of any kind. This is done because then when the game goes to reviewers, the microtransactions are not looming over them like Batman the entire time. And then the game is scored favorably based on its content, story, mechanics, and so on and the score is likely higher than it would be. Then, what a lot of these sorts of games do, like Tekken, Street Fighter, or any other live service S game does, is once the reviews come out and the scores are solidified, saying, oh, this game is great, it has all of this content, and it all feels fair, and so on, then these studios, across the board, will release a ghost patch about a month or so after release. And suddenly, these games will have cash shops all of a sudden, and now the studios and publishers get the higher-than-usual Metacritic scores, and they also get to dabble in the live service elements and make money off their dedicated fan bases as well. The reason why I'm talking about delayed cash shops is because that's what this Tifa thing is like. A company can lure you in with the promise of no censorship, have you buy the game and enjoy it, then once the transaction is complete, and maybe a month or five passes, or four years in Remake's case, then they go back and stealth patch it like this with Tifa for example. And now the game has your money, and the ethics department gets what they want in the end anyway. It's disingenuous, and really scummy in my opinion, and I'm disappointed to see Square Enix doing this to any capacity. Especially considering how much of a celebration there was when Tifa's huge givers of life were shown and how the fanbase responded to it. By doing this, no matter how much time has passed, it creates a scenario where fans of not just Final Fantasy, but any game or property could be roped into buying something and supporting it only to have their trust and dedication soured post-mortem. And I personally don't think that's okay, nor is censorship in any form. Again, I know Tifa is 15 in this moment in the game, so yes, she's still a teenager. But I'm not necessarily mad about this change myself because again, she's underage here. But I do take umbrage at the fact that Square Enix is essentially selling a product and promoting it as one thing only to change what that product is once payments are finalized. It's less about the fact that Tifa is a teen here and it's more to do with the ethical use of censorship and the breach of trust in players and publishers. Who's to say that the massive punching bags of Tifa in Rebirth will not be in a year or something get censored as well? I personally don't condone the use of censorship, and I find it woefully pathetic regardless. This then brings up the question of, does this mean Square Enix Ethics Department is alive and well still? 
The answer to that might be that yes, they are. But of course, people will say, well, their online page is gone, which is also true. But it's likely that Square Enix's ethics department is akin to Palpatine in Star Wars. Thought long to be dead, but secretly cooking schemes behind the scenes without anyone knowing of their existence. In terms of what this ethics department's role is when it comes to Square's games, their website said back in 2022 that... Checking all games' expressions, including scenarios, illustrations, designs, and effects, to ensure that they do not contain expressions that are discriminatory, prejudicial. I can't say that word. Prejudicial. I can't say it. Prejudicial. I can't say it. Oh my god. Or offensive. Whatever. Moving on. While I understand you need someone to ensure your game isn't covered in, say, hateful symbols or something, I think stuff like the cleavage of a character or the outfit of someone is reaching a little too far. Because you're losing consumer trust by doing things like this, and personally, Square Enix gains absolutely nothing by doing this in the end. All they're going to do is piss off their fans and make potential buyers not willing to support their future endeavors. It's basically pandering to the modern audience while rejecting the actual audience that was going to buy your game in the first place. But now that you have pandered, these eager buyers will now look elsewhere, and it's a shame because I can tell that Rebirth is going to be great. And I was hoping, especially considering the existence of Final Fantasy XVI from last year, that Square had put this behind them. Because XVI proved that Square Enix was willing and able to create a game devoid of identity politics and instead just deliver a quality experience that actually felt premium. And I feel as if by doing what they're doing here, it's worrying to me. Because I love Final Fantasy. It's my favorite game series ever. And Seven in particular, like the basic bitch I am, is my favorite in the series as well. So to have any form of censorship like this, it leaves me in a state of annoyance. Because I love Square Enix games, and I regularly play and buy their games almost constantly. But when they pull things like this, it makes it really difficult to defend them when they're doing exactly what people don't want them to do. Although this is reminiscent of back in 2019 when it was confirmed that Remake would tighten Tifa's chest. The reasoning for this apparently was not due to over-sexualization, but gameplay according to Tetsuya Nomura. Who, if you don't know who that guy is, he created the iconic designs like Cloud, Sephiroth, Tifa, and is also the man who conceptualized and created the entire Kingdom Hearts universe. While interviewed by Famitsu, Nomura said regarding Tifa's chest that, We wanted Tifa to have abs, so she now has more of an athletic body type. The ethics department at Square Enix also said we had to tighten her chest so it doesn't look unnatural during all the intense fighting. Because of that, we added black thigh highs and tank top. Another reason given was that because of Tifa's fast-paced gameplay style, her big fat cushions of justice would allegedly get in the way of her fists while fighting. And so in order to make her animations quicker and make more sense in-game, they reduced her Warlocks of Evermore to a smaller size. But I think I speak for everyone, especially those who played the original 7 on PS1, that Tifa's Milkers of Legend were never really something anyone hated. If anything, we loved it, and it was borderline meme-worthy how huge those bonkers got by the end of the game. I think the only reason this is happening is solely because Square Enix, like so many other companies these days, are terrified of the nuclear western response from gaming sites and so on. And if I had to wager, Square Enix is likely looking at Rebirth and thinking this game has to score well and also needs to sell well to justify its existence. And sadly, Metacritic scores are still important in today's world. And if Square Enix were to offend these western journalists with something like Tiva's huge bongo drums that could affect the game's final Metacritic score. So in order to ensure they don't piss off the reviewers, who they know are often raised in these identity political environments, they do things like restrict Tifa's chest to ensure the review process and the actual game and all the work that goes into art, music, sound design, and so on, isn't lost and ruined because some feminists with pink hair got mad that a beautiful woman is on screen and they can't relate. However, at the same time, what this ends up doing is pissing off the people who really matter, which is of course, you dear viewer. Because without you, there is no Final Fantasy VII Remake or Rebirth or anything else. It's due to your support financially that these games can and continue to exist. So by doing these things, it just angers the loyal fans of the product at the cost of appeasing weirdos who don't buy your games anyways. Mostly because these journos obviously get them for free because, you know, they review it and it's not good. But of course, this gets even worse since Nexus Mods, which I've reported on the past, is infested with woke weirdos. And they have now been banning any mods on their website that restored Tifa's look before the patch that released recently. 
So, yet again, like every other time I've reported on Nexus mods, they've again banned and silenced their community by not allowing people to mod games the way that they want. At this point, I don't even know why anyone even uses Nexus mods if they actually care about modding their experience. Because half the time, you can't even do any mods unless it meets the criteria of some moderator at Nexus who likely has Dorito Dust on their keyboard. The concept of a modding site is to do just that, host and compile mods for ease of use and access to players. That's it, that's where the ethics and opinion should end with this, but of course not. And this now proves that Nexus mods like other sites such as Game Banana with the whole Tomb Raider mod ban thing I reported on already, are enforcing their own code of ethics upon a hobby that should be free of such nonsense. Need I remind you that Nexus Mods does still have mods where you can end the lives of children in Skyrim or Fallout still to this day? But remove a t-shirt added post update in a Japanese game, well now you've gone too far apparently. And I just hate to see censorship like this all over the place. I mean, Square has done this before too. In Bravely Default, they covered up the character models more as well compared to the Japanese release as you can see here. And in Chrono Cross Remastered, they changed dialogue like this where it seems like it was changed to not a fan feminist, I guess? Regardless, it's stupid and unnecessary. Ultimately, I'm disappointed to see Square Enix doing this, and all I can hope is that they listen to their fans and backpedal against all of this in the future. My advice is to make your voice heard, send emails, reviews, or anything towards Square Enix if you can. I wouldn't say boycott their games, because generally speaking, they are quality products and they should be played. Especially Remake or Rebirth, but I think Square's devs are just stuck in a rock and a hard place right now. And they need the community of fans to tell them to stop being so afraid of Western feminist agendas and just embrace what makes Square Enix so beloved to begin with. That would be my advice, because I would be depressed if Square was lost to the identity political nonsense of today. And speaking of nonsense, it looks like PlayStation Studios has laid off people, so what the hell is happening over there? According to Bloomberg's Jason Schreier, Sony is laying off around 8% of its workforce, which comes to around 900 jobs across Sony Studios. One of the major games affected was apparently a live-service Twisted Metal game being made at Fire Sprite Studios, which was a new studio that Sony acquired last year, if memory serves me correctly. What's also crazy is even the big dogs at Sony aren't safe from this layoff with even Insomniac Games who did Spider-Man, Having some layoffs, however, we don't know exactly how many people there was that got laid off, as well as Naughty Dog, which you know for Uncharted and The Last of Us. Again, also, we don't know how many got laid off there either. Then there's Guerrilla Games, which is losing 40 people, which is 10% of their team, and they did games like Horizon and Killzone. And the biggest closure here is the London studio, which has made all kinds of games as well as VR titles for Sony. Their entire studio is shut down effectively immediately. And what many people are pointing out is how Jim Ryan, who oversees PlayStation, was photographed at London Studios literally a few days ago. And he's all smiles here, surrounded by people he knew would be laid off in the next few days. This photo is just bleak, dude. Good lord is it ever. Just brutal. Head of PlayStation Studios Herman Hull said one of the reasons for these layoffs is that sometimes great ideas don't become great games apparently. Jim Ryan also sent an email that of course leaked and this was sent to everyone affected by these layoffs. It said, and I quote, The PlayStation community means everything to us, so I felt it was important to update you on a difficult day at our company. We have made the extremely hard decision to announce our plan to commence a reduction of our overall headcount globally by about 8% or about 900 people. Subject to local law and consultation processes, employees across the globe, including our studios, are impacted. These are incredibly talented people who have been a part of our success and we are very grateful for their contributions. However, the industry has changed immensely and we need to future ready ourselves to set the business up for what lies ahead. We need to deliver on expectations from developers and gamers and continue to propel future technology and gaming so we took a step back to ensure we are set up to continue bringing the best gaming experiences to the community. We deeply appreciate support and understanding from the PlayStation community as these decisions are very difficult. Please rest assured that our plans for reorganizing and streamlining are so we can continue to deliver the best gaming experiences possible, end quote. This, of course, has gone over as well as you think it did when it comes to the PlayStation fanbase, with many blasting Jim Ryan and Herman Hull saying how dare they ruin these studios while not slashing their own salaries instead. And you can find all over social media plenty of affected developers saying they're now jobless and are looking for work. 
This now amounts to almost 6,000 jobs lost in video games in 2024 alone. And if you combine it with 2023's layoffs, it's almost 20,000 people laid off in about a year now. Not only is this just bad for morale, but think about all the young, promising game developers out there who aspire to work for PlayStation or their favorite game studio. How are all of these layoffs going to look and affect the newer generations of talent? At this point, it's a real question to ask yourself if you want to get into game development, which is, is it even worth it now? when the risks are so high and the fallout is just so constant. I wouldn't blame anyone if they course corrected their career out of games seeing how volatile and unstable the job market is there. It's not just PlayStation obviously, Xbox laid off 1900 people this year already, Embracer Group laid off hundreds as well, and tons of games are getting cancelled across the board. I am noticing however that the majority of the game's cancellations that we know of anyway are live service ones. If I had to guess, Sony, Xbox, and more are likely looking at the failures of recent titles like Suicide Squad and Skull and Bones as reasons to get out of live service game development now instead of dumping more resources into it. Remember too, the Naughty Dog's live service Last of Us Factions game got cancelled. And if I had to guess, those layoffs in Naughty Dog are likely attached to that project. And during the Insomniac leaks, which I won't show, but there was concept art of a cancelled or soon to be cancelled Spider-Verse game where players could make their own spider person and fight multiverse threats with their friends as spider men or women. If I had to guess, those Insomniac layoffs probably tied to that game too. It also doesn't help that just across the board, game development costs have skyrocketed. Spider-Man 2 apparently cost something like $300 million to make. And that's a game you can finish to completion in Platinum in less than 30 hours, so that's an insanely expensive game release. And these games, with their huge budgets, obviously need to sell millions upon millions of copies or they face layoffs or closures. And it's simply not sustainable anymore. And I think what we're going to see is fewer AAA massive games coming out of anywhere across the industry. And I think what the industry needs more now than ever is not just a reduction from their inflated budgets, but game prices too. Make shorter games that aren't as taxing, that don't take 10 years to make like Skull and Bones, and then price them accordingly. From the early 2010s to about now, the concept of the middle tier game and their prices have largely evaporated from the gaming ecosystem, and they've all been replaced by expensive live service games or stuff like Spider-Man. And it's more obvious than ever that the bubble has long burst, not to mention I think another big reason for why these layoffs are happening as well is because of something no one really wants to say, so I will. But during the pandemic, of course, a lot of games were being made remotely because obviously people couldn't go into studios which resulted in people leaving companies or moving out of state, etc. A lot of nonsense was happening and it was understandable. So what a lot of these studios and publishers did was they basically overhired across the board for all their departments. And this led to these games being worked on remotely, having more people than they likely needed to finish the projects. And due to this overhiring, budgets ballooned and eventually imploded, and now in 2024, we are now four years removed from the pandemic, and the costs and returns on investment from that hiring frenzy and pandemic era are starting to catch up with all the major publishers. And now that things are returned to, well, I wouldn't say normal, but you know, more normal than it was during the pandemic anyway, like people returning to working in offices and so on, this has led to a ton of bloat at every major studio and so on. And so in response, there is now this massive purge that's going on. To paint a picture for you, imagine each major publisher, Sony, Xbox, and so on, they're all rocket ships. And each added piece of the rocket ship is a group of devs they overhired, or projects that were live service or other projects that simply weren't working. Basically, these publishers have to purge the added weight of what's no longer necessary to ensure their rocket ship doesn't get pulled down by all the excess weight so they can fly, and that's what's happening. Yes, I just made a spaceship metaphor, I hope it makes sense, but you get what I mean. It's either these publishers keep all of these people and blow it up, or do the awful act of layoffs to ensure they're more streamlined. I'm not siding with the publishers or anything by the way, I'm just telling you the uncomfortable reality of what's really going on. So you can shoot the messenger if you want, but I'm gonna say it because a lot of journalists won't because they'll get backlash from their social circles. If stuff like The Last of Us live service wasn't working or this Twisted Metal live service, then obviously Sony has a few options. They either keep the devs and allocate them, but realistically you only have so much space in a studio or on teams. Think of it like a kitchen at a restaurant. Again, here I go with the metaphors, but the kitchen cooking the food has stations. And it can only have so many people on it before the line gets overcrowded with people. 
You could force more people online, but it doesn't help and actually just hampers the quality control if you just streamlined the entire line in Expo and ensured it had enough people already. That's why these devs aren't being kept. There simply just isn't enough budget, projects, or space to keep them online. So yes, now I've made a kitchen and a rocket ship comparison. I promise I'm done with the metaphors now. But as you can see, the ultimate result is that there was a ton of bloat, too much overhiring during COVID, too many projects that are likely live service or in London Studios case, VR related. Which Sony has already said, VR hasn't been going well for anyone regardless across the industry right now. And they're left in a spot where you either keep people and bloat up or streamline. It just sucks that this industry is like this. And I'm not saying that Sony was good to do this or if Xbox was before either. But these layoffs and all of this has been nothing short of a result of what the past few years has proven, which is that game budgets are out of control, inflation is way too high, and there is far too much quantity and content without enough quality. And in terms of the Final Fantasy VII Tifa thing, it's a result of tone deafness and fear retribution by feminists. None of these things are good that they happened, but I hope this video helped you understand why they are happening. I hope anyone impacted finds a job, and like I've been saying for a long time now, there's a rot in this industry and it needs to be fixed. I guess time will tell, but as always, thank you for watching. Subscribe, share, and like the video if you enjoyed it. Thanks to my patrons and keep your heads up, friends. It's only February and so much has already happened. God knows what's coming in the near future. But until then, I'll see you in the next one.